And are we thinking somewhere like 90 minutes max? Is that the idea? Or what yeah, did you... I think so. Yeah, I th that sounds great. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, great. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining. I think I've met most of you, but if you don't know, I'm Sarah Calloway. I'm the director here at the Louisville Academy of Music, and I'm so excited to introduce Stephen Vitello to talk to us about his career as a sound artist and as a composer. Um, I first heard of Stephen, he has a work out at Al Shands, um, which is a farm in Crestwood and there's a, a sound piece made with the wind out there. Um, and he also came and spoke at Bernheim Forest and I've had the honor of working with him a few times after that. So I'm just very excited to have him talk to our school virtually today and welcome Stephen. Thank you. <laughs> Nice to meet you all. I've heard we've got an audience from vast age group and very different experience. Um, I hope I can do a good job of covering and, you know, please, especially with a group this small, anything that you want to stop me, either something that doesn't make sense, you'd like to hear more about, or suddenly there's this feeling of, yeah, 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 we know that. You know, anything you want to tell me, um, I'm more than happy to do. Um, I'm in my studio in my garage and it's messy and chaotic, but you know, I'm also hooked up to hard drives. So there's also the advantage of being able to, if you say, what about, you know, a little bit more of this or something, um, show and tell. I, I didn't do it intentionally, but there's this amazing show and tell microphone over my shoulder, a binaural microphone that's, I think it's, it's, cost as much as a used car these days from what I hear, but it records the way your ears hear. Um, I'll talk a little bit about field recording in a little while. But my plan is to talk about some of my projects and some of the work I've done, um, field recording, installation, uh, electronic music, and soundtracks, and, and then show you a little bit of parts of how I work. Um, I'm truly not that technically adept, but you know, live and work with technology every day. Um, and then we could listen to some of your sounds, mess with them, see if something spontaneous could happen, even you know, a, a group composition, or just even just showing you some of what, you know, especially for people who are newer to working with technology, you know, just the, the wonders of of quick manipulations of taking something like your voice or an instrument and, and changing its pitch, playing it backwards, um, layering it with somebody else's piece. And, and, you know, sort of like jury duty, like, you know, you sort of all came together and we've got you, I guess you're part of the community of the school, but who showed up, who contributed, what sounds, there's a kind of wonderful, let's see what happens. Um, so again, please don't hesitate to stop me. Um, but I'll, I'll just sort of jump into a little bit of an artist talk and um, you know, share my screen, share sound, keynote. Okay. So I put this together. Um, let me make that little window go smaller. Do you see your faces or do you just see the screen? We just see the screen, or at least I Okay, don't. good, then I won't worry about it. Okay, so I always start with the same project um, to get, I mean, maybe to back up. I live in Richmond, Virginia now. I'm a professor at Virginia Commonwealth University and the chair of a department called Kinetic Imaging. But I grew up in New York. Um, I first started playing in punk rock bands long ago in the late 70s and kind of post-punk bands. And really my creative life changed. In college, I started to be exposed to experimental film and video. I did an internship at the Museum of Modern Art in the video department. And I think then it was called the video program. Uh, and I had never been, and I'm not saying this to be humble, it's totally true. I was never a good musician. But I played in bands, I worked really hard, and I just, I played guitar and bass. It just never, I, I've never been skilled at playing the things that I thought I was supposed to be skilled at. But when I 
started to be exposed to other forms of video art, uh, experimental film, later sound art and experimental music, certain things kind of clicked. And I realized that there was other ways of approaching working with sound, um, other ways of playing guitar. The first time I heard Fred Frith's record, Guitar Solos, I swear that the next day I, I was different and I found that there was a whole new vocabulary and that just because I couldn't play a, you know, a fast guitar line that maybe I could still do something expressive. And I did soundtracks for video artists We're starting right after college. Tony Ausler was one of the first artists I ever worked with. Um, I don't know if people know Tony's work, but he works with projections, dolls. And after I meet with you today, there's a, a, an event this evening. I've got another of this event where we're, we're um, talking about a performance web project and CD-ROM. We did something like 27 years ago for, um, as part of a live event for the Diaz uh, Art Foundation. And the more, so the more I did, you know, worked with other artists and learned a kind of vocabulary. First project I did with Tony was an installation. I didn't even know what an installation was at the time. He invited me to work on it, but I was so excited for the opportunity. Um, and the more I worked with other artists, the more I found my own voice. And 1998, a museum in um, France said that they wanted to do a retrospective of my soundtracks. And I said, that's great. And they said, unless you do installations. And I said, oh yes, I do installations. But I hadn't done installations. I just think I was ready to do installations and work with space, create multi-speaker, multi-channel pieces. It just magically fell at the right moment. And soon after I did that, a couple other projects happened. Um, I was invited to apply for a residency at the World Trade Center. And the idea is that you have six months to have a free studio, 24 hours a day. It turned out to be on the 91st floor. Uh, but when you propose to have the residency, you just, well, that was a sweet sound. Um, you just had to say that, you know, you had to describe a project that you would do. And I had read about an artist uh, named Marianne Amache who recently passed away. And there's a beautiful new book of her writings and archives, but she had done a piece with microphones, um, I think it was City Links, but various projects. But one of them was had microphones mounted towards the New England fisheries with sound being sent by phone lines. I think this is right into her studio. So I thought, well, what if when I'm up in the World Trade Center, I just, I mount microphones out the window and I can always have sound streaming into my studio. And I got the residency. Um, I always tell the same story, but I didn't know that I wouldn't be actually able to open the windows. So I had to figure out ways to get sound through the windows and hit on using these contact microphones. Um, this one was one of the real ones. This one was actually for phone recordings and didn't work, but it looks cool. Um, but contact mics, like these mics I bought at the drum shop in New York City, it was called Manny's and they were sold so that you would put it on the surface of a drum. And when you hit the drum, it would the vibration would be transferred to a synthesizer and you could hit the drum and then it would be whatever you wanted it to be. Um, but it could also work as a microphone based on surface vibration. So if I put it in front of me, I'd hear nothing, but if I put it on my throat or my heart or an object, you would hear through the vibration. And if anybody's interested, I could send you links on where to buy them or how to make them for a few dollars. Um, you know, they're really, they're really magical little tools. They won't solve all your needs, but they will get you a sound that you would never get. Uh, and just to play a little, little bit of sound that, you know, if you know my work, you already have heard this, but in um, September of 99, I think it was September, uh, Hurricane Floyd hit, and it was the second strongest hurricane to hit New York in the decade. Uh, we weren't allowed in the building, but the next morning I went into my studio and I could hear the room creaking and cracking, and I could hear the building swaying. Um, 
even without the microphones, but this will, hope if this plays properly, uh, you'll hear a little bit of sound from the studio. Hopefully you're hearing that. keep moving a little bit quickly, but also if anybody ever wants to hear more, a lot of these things I can point you to are online. Um, but that project changed everything for me. When I was working in the studio, I would try to add other sounds to that environmental sound. And nothing that I added was as strong as the sound itself. And hearing that sound totally changed. For me and other visitors we reported that how they experienced space, what they saw suddenly was very different because of what they were hearing. Um, and it really, I feel like I entered that residency thinking of myself as a soundtrack composer. And I left thinking of myself as a sound artist who was interested in site specific projects. Kind of amazingly, uh, that project led me to an exhibition in France curated by a uh, a man named Paul Varelio, who's a theorist. And because that went so well, the museum, the Cartier Foundation said, oh, we're, you're gonna be in our next show and we're sending you to the Amazon to do field recordings among the Yanomami and um, make a work. And I, you know, field recording, going out in the field with nice microphones, is not something I'd done deeply. Uh, it's very different using those contact mics, but I, like a lot of things, opportunities opened up and I kind of jumped on them. Um, I was flown out to this village. This, this mountain is called the Windy Mountain in the Yanomami language. Um, it's one of the last hunting and gathering cultures in the world. Um, they'd seen you know, very, very, very few. They, the children said I was the whitest person they had ever seen and wondered if there was something wrong with me. Uh, it's a very remote space and I was unbelievably lucky to go there. There's me with nicer hair and looking far less old. Um, I'd go out and do, you know, do sound recordings. And, and if I would always engage with people with eye contact to see if I had permission to record sounds, record pictures. And if the, it was mostly the kids who engaged, but they would come and look at their pictures through this little vintage 2003 digital camera, or I'd put headphones on them um, if they wanted. Uh, this was kind of wildly, there was in the eighties, there was gonna be an Amazon highway that they started cutting in, which would have destroyed so much land. But this was part of the Amazon highway that never was made this path. I'll play just a little bit of sound in the forest. was I recorded probably 30 hours or so of sound and it was being a diehard New Yorker at that point, not realizing the beauty of natural sounds, not knowing, I mean, you know, I've still like any of us scratched the smallest of surface, but going out there, I heard a world I could never ever have dreamed of. And, you know, just in that moment, there's all this different sound going on in, spatially all around that, was so beautiful, but also that the more I listen, the more I hear it changing throughout the day. And um, I asked one of the shaman through a translator, which are the, like the spiritual leaders of, say the priests of the, of the village. 
about sound. And he said, oh, you're interested in the heya. And so the translator, who's an anthropologist, kind of look and say, who thought he knew, you know, I mean, he really does know the culture, but he'd never asked about sound. And it turned out that for the shaman, every sound that they hear can be translated to a kind of meaning. So like a woodpecker in the late afternoon could mean that a woman is gonna become pregnant with her second child, a woman in the village. Another sound can mean something else. I'll give you just a little bit more sound so you hear his voice too. It takes a moment for him to come to the foreground. But one thing that was just interesting to me was I thought from our culture, I'm used to, you know, if you go to a, a church or a temple or synagogue you know, service, like when someone speaks, everything else stops. And, but here, every, life would go on. And I asked about that and people said, well, but we're always listening. And they seem to be listening on multiple levels. They were also, you know, to go into the forest they were listening and they would shoot things out of the trees that I could never see. But for survival, for safety, for communication, listening was just, it was something that people were doing all the time and on multiple levels. And it didn't have to be, well, we were stopping and this is happening. It just, it was part of the, the landscape. So, you know, I've done a lot of different kinds of projects. Um, one thing that interested me would many years ago when I kind of entered the world of experimental music, I asked Pauline Oliveros, who's one of the great figures in experimental music, if I could study with her. And she laughed and she said, no, you'll do a concert with me and Joe McPhee next week, who's a great jazz musician. And she said, if you want to study, go and start studying John Cage's graphic scores. And Hopefully, if, if you've never looked at Cage's scores, they're, I mean, they're beautiful artworks. They're also amazing systems to be performed. Um, and in 2007, I made a few graphic scores of my own, more conceptual than necessarily thinking that they could be, you know, that these were notes on a staff. But there are people who have taken some of these and looked at ways of interpreting them. Um, you know, especially, I mean, I, my understanding is that most of you are classically trained or, in, or being classically trained and, and, you know, score probably means something very straight in one way to you, but there's so way, many ways of communicating how, what music is, what music could be, how it could be played. Um, and kind of coming out of field recording and taking pictures when I field do field recording is just sort of looking at ways that I could cross that line into making something graphic that represented music. Um, this one's sort of murky and muddy, but, um, and then this one coming from the same photos that I made in Maine when I was there for a residency. In 2008, I did a project, I got asked to work with the group Eighth Blackbird, who maybe some of you know are a classical music ensemble. Um, it was interesting because I was, I know this is going on YouTube and I don't know, I, <laughs> I never really, I, I always say things I probably shouldn't say, but basically I was invited to work with them based on having a record on New Albion, which was a, a a known record label that a respected record label that has released John Cage and Lou Harrison and others. But then when I said how I worked, I think there was some confusion. And I said that I just wanted to give them lists of things of sounds to make and I would record each one of them. And could they each make the sound of an animal and could they each play a short melody of three notes. Um, 
I indicated certain kinds of in, improvisation and then was told that classical musicians are not happy improvising and it's a different training. Um, maybe that's why I still like working with Sarah because she seems to be able to cover both, both bases, but nevertheless, four of the six members of the group did a recording with me and um, I played it in a concert hall with 12 speakers, so sounds were all around. And when it was over, the two musicians from the group who had decided not to work with me came up and said that they really liked what I had done and actually would be interested to work with me. And, and I felt kind of joyful to feel like, even if my system was not what they were used to, that the results were, were convincing. Um, maybe I'll just play a little bit of this. This was, so there's a CD, it's also on Bandcamp. Um, I think I did six pieces with them. This is called Russian Lullaby, and I'll just, you know, I think it's nine minutes, but I'll just play a minute or two. is my favorite part, but for some reason Keynote doesn't give me a little window to, to drag. But if, if you're curious, you could go on my band camp and listen. The ending is, is, a, is the prettiest and it sort of goes from chaos to having some order. Um, and I'll show you later, but you know, basically I'm, I'm I mean, arguably composing, but moving sounds, manipulating sounds, creating a structure. Um, again, this will probably speak to most of you. <laughs> But I was in a meeting recently with someone from a music department and they were saying that basically anything that is not notated is not composed, it's just organized. And I felt like they're probably not up to date with forms of thought that go back at least to the 1930s and what composition might be. But you know, all of these things are based on our backgrounds and traditions. And um, in any case, Couple more projects, if you don't mind. Um, I did a, an installation in New York on the High Line, which is a, a park, an elevated park in 2010. And when they first brought me up to the High Line, it was even before the park was built, but it was a, a raised platform, an old um, track, it's graffitied over, there was grass, we had to wear hard, hard hats. And I was like, What's, what idea do I have? And I remember that the first sound that I ever heard when I was in the World Trade Center through my microphones were church bells. And you know, here I was again on the Hudson River looking out to the water and I thought, you know, kind of almost every culture has bells. Um, I didn't wanna make an artwork in a public space that was excluding, you know, if someone didn't know something, then they couldn't enjoy it. And I thought, you know, most religions have bells, sporting events, schools, um, you know, there's uh, bars, you know, some bars like Irish bars will ring a, you know, a bell last call. Um, anyway, I made a, I had an idea for a piece called A Bell for Every Minute. 
and I recorded bells all over New York City. This was a, Jap a bell from Japan. It was at the United Nations, um, the New York Stock Exchange. It's a really, really, really loud bell. It was so loud that I jumped um, off, no joke, this like cartoon thing where your, your feet go off the ground um, when they rang it. But it's an iconic sound that everybody who's watched a TV news show has probably heard that bang, 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 bang. Uh, I was recorded, I was invited to a space, uh, it's a chapel right across from the World Trade Center fell, where, uh, where the World Trade Center fell. And there's a bell that was gifted from England that's rung for victims of 9-11. And there are ceremonies where the bell is rung for each person who was lost. And they invited me out to just listen and record the bell by myself outside of ceremony. And I'll just I'll play you a little bit of the sound of it. Thing. I mean, she rang that bell for three minutes. It was right off Broadway in New York City. I don't know how, but traffic stopped. Um, if you hear it on really nice speakers, you hear a little crackle. It's actually rain dripping off the, the bell. And I have a beautiful microphone um, there made by a company called Sheps that is very responsive. I mean, it picks up everything, but it would also pick up traffic. Somehow there's no traffic. Um, so with, with the installation, what I did was I made a structure I, out of 120 bells, I picked 59. And at the beginning of the hour, they all ring together. And then after that, one bell per minute. Um, and I'll play you what it sounds like at the beginning of the hour. It's loud, I apologize, but it's every kind of bell that I'd recorded from the little bell on a cat's collar to a church, to a synagogue, to a sporting uh, horse race, to a, a yoga studio. Um, I think that one was cheating because it was actually a Tibetan bowl, but I decided it was okay to call it a bell. Anyway, let's hear it, but again, it's gonna be loud. <laughs> So at the beginning of the hour, that would ring exactly on the hour. And then there's this, um, and if you can see it over here, there's this aluminum sound map that's about five feet high. And then you could go and see that one minute after the hour, two minutes after the hour, let's say that bell that I played you previously, like it might say on the map, um, St. I think it was St. Paul's Chapel, I forget, um, you know, 31 minutes after the hour, St. Paul's, and you could trace physically where in New York it was recorded, um, people would go up and look at it. And then very, very quietly in between the bells on the minute was a, an electronic piece I made using the bell sounds. Um, it should be much quieter than you're gonna hear it, but I think it's here in this file. control it through this app, but it's real that part is meant to be really quiet. I'm, I'm forever influenced by my friend Steve Roden, who's my favorite sound artist, who makes very, very quiet pieces. And 
So I wanted the main bells to be loud, but then that part was so quiet that you didn't know if your ears were just ringing kind of creatively. Um, that piece was later at the Museum of Modern Art in their garden, sculpture garden. And then they asked me to make a concert with Camille Normant, who's a musician artist. Um, I don't know how to play percussion, but I had someone make me these bells out of glass that look very much like Harry Parch uh, bells, um, cloud chamber bowls, but they had a very, their own sound. Um, Camille was playing glass harmonica and other glass instruments. So I thought I would have this glass instrument that I have this, I guess I found that I like to scare myself and, and learn on the spot and respond on the spot. And so I just, I played them, I manipulated their sound um, without expertise, but just with some kind of dedication to listening. And, and um, you know, we just, we listened, we improvised, we didn't have a score. I think Camille really wanted something more structured, but I resisted and somehow uh, we, I think we did a very nice job. So a couple more projects. And if, if anybody's getting itchy or you wanna just stop and talk, just please let me know. Um, Sarah mentioned this piece that's in, in Kentucky outside of, um, outside of Louisville. Al Shands has this beautiful art collection. Maybe some of you have been there, I don't know. Uh, he invited me to make an artwork. Nothing, when I went there, nothing was technology based. It was all sculpture, painting. Uh, he said that he wanted to, me to make something that honored his wife and that she loved sound and I went there not knowing exactly what I would do, but I brought my guitar and it's really, really windy. And I don't know if anybody knows what an Aeolian harp is, but it's, it's an instrument, traditionally it would sit in the window and it was a string instrument or it is a string instrument, It'd sit in the window and you'd open the window and you tune all the strings to the same, I think this isn't right, to the same um, note. And as the wind would come in, it would, resonate and depending on the intensity of the wind uh, strings would would start to vibrate and there was some amazing um, there was time there was some beautiful poetry there was a time in medicine where people talked about the body like an alien harp like our nervous system was strings vibrating sending messages i think to the heart and the brain um, but I made a piece with this semi hollow body telecaster. Uh, and this, I don't know if this will be hard to follow, but, or perfectly hard, easy to follow since you're all musical based. But I worked with my technician, Bob Bulecki, who's worked with Laurie Anderson, um, Bill Viola, so many great people. And we, in the entrance way to Al's place, we noticed that there was harmonics that would resonate really um, sweetly if you hit them just right. And if, if you just hit that note really softly, you hear it ring out. And Bob has got a way better pitch than I do. And so he would sing these notes until something would just echo naturally. So we tuned each one of the six strings of my guitar to those harmonics um, and then let the wind play the guitar and then played that sound back in the entranceway where it still sits in, in Al's ranch, his art collection. And it, because it, those, the resonances were tuned to the architectural structure, we're playing it very quietly on pretty cheap speakers. And it just seems to sing in that space because it's really tuned to the architecture. So here's a, a, short, a short video where you get an idea of what the sound is.
seen a couple other people have done similar pieces recently. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, claiming who did what first is always hard because whatever I've done, I know others have done in, in many times in different forms. Um, but to give you the backstory on that, 25 years ago, I did music for a dancer. I was part of, part of a performance for a dancer outside. And the first piece was meant to be silent or no music. And the second piece, we were several of us were playing guitars. And when she did the dance for the first piece, I heard the most beautiful sound. And I was like, hey, she told us it was going to be quiet or, or silent. And she must have found somebody to do the music. But wow, this is so nice. And then we went up for the second piece to perform. And I realized that my guitar had been on. <laughs> And that basically the wind had been playing the guitar in that first piece. And there was this kind of accidental soundtrack that was created. And um, so I always thought that I would recreate that someday. And it just kind of came together when I went to Al's space. And um, if, you ever, if, if you ever get to go out to his collection, you know, that gives you a little bit of background. Okay. This is a piece that Sarah, I'm so fortunate, is on, as well as her husband, um, many other musicians, several other, several, several, a few years ago, I was at Montalvo in um, California. It's a residency space and a garden and many other things. They asked me to do an outdoor installation. And I went, I flew out there, I was walking around, I went in the library and I found this beautiful, um, Book, which is a libretto and score for a, a play from 1925. And I didn't really pay attention to anything but the cover. I just thought the cover was so beautiful and I thought I would make a work based on the cover. Um, but as I looked at the libretto, I found that there were these beautiful descriptions of sound. Um, this is followed by the curiously syncopated theme of the earth bugs. I hear the rush of sunflies wings. And I use those as inspiration. Uh, and I created created some kind of graphic scores that were just more for representation. Um, and I made a piano piece that I recorded and then re performed resampling it. I'll show you in a few minutes um, what I'm talking about. But then I invited a whole bunch of fantastic musicians to perform. Uh, to to what I had done and then all with the understanding that I would edit and manipulate and have some freedom for what the, you know they would listen to what I'd done but I would also play with that one of the most thrilling sessions was with a foley artist named Shelley Roden and this is in the foley stage of Skywalker sound in California foley probably most of you know but is where sounds are made for film, radio, television, hands-on, following action. Um, you can't quite see it, but like for any of you who've seen Finding Dory or Finding Nemo, um, Shelly, whose back is turned to us, like she did, there's a little kiddie pool. She did all the flipper sounds in a little kiddie pool with things that she bought at the dollar store. And she'd take a spatula and she'd watch a screen with a fish swimming and she'd make the sounds of their flippers. Um, all that, and she'd take a colander and put it in water and pull it up to get the bubble sounds. Uh, there's the, oh, the, the door from, um, and there's just, there's like this Boeing instrument that was made by the person who makes instruments for Joni Mitchell that was, and this Boeing instrument was used for Roger, who killed Roger Rabbit. Uh, it's it's like it's, it's insane how much beauty has happened there, and sounds that you would never imagine were made the way they were made. And so Shelley was basically one of the band, but she made wing sounds. She, she would take a feather and put it against the wheels of a wheelchair, spin the wheelchair, and um, and she performed these things. It wasn't just a sound, but she would perform them, and she would listen to my sixteen-minute music piece and perform like just as Sarah played violin to it or Dan played French horn to it or any number of other people um, perform to it. Uh, here she is putting a feather in the wheelchair and it's, it's a 
incredible sound. So this was outdoors. Um, it would play mostly just to an empty, empty amphitheater, but I'll, I'll play you a couple minutes of it or a minute and a half of it. Um, I, again, I did the piano part, that's the foundation and everything kind of followed to that. It's a big sheet. keeps going. Um, I just thought I'd show you, uh, this is only about a third of the Pro Tools session. Um, you can see on top was a um, part of my piano track on that first line, and then some of the violin. And you can see the um, both the violin and the uh, room might picking up the violin. There's so many decisions that are made. But, Sarah sent me a beautiful performance, but then I made these decisions, changing volume, where it goes down, it means the sound is going out or going out. Um, things were also moving left and right. Uh, sometimes reverb was added. Hundreds and hundreds of decisions, which is why when you know someone says something is not composed unless it's notated, I still feel like it's so structured and there's so many decisions being made it's not, you know, in my mind, it's not just moving sounds around until something sounds working, I mean, or, or maybe it is, but there's a whole lot of decision-making. Part of it for me is intuition, part of it is taste, part of it hopefully is the, an acquired um, ability over years of working. But there's more and more below this that you're not seeing. Okay, I think, okay, so, I'm going to leave this window. I thought I would show you two things, a little bit about working with soundtrack and a little bit of work with your sounds. Actually, maybe we'll just jump to Ableton Live for a second. But tell me, how are you guys doing? Do you have any questions or comments so far? I'm opening up a program as as you as you think. If you have a question, you can unmute yourself or you can put something in the chat too. Exactly. Great. I had a question. Please. Um, when you when you did the piece with the bells, where they rang, when they all rang at the same time, mm -hmm. what did you 
just play all the bells the start of every file at once or did you kind of decide to like bam 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 like trigger them you know line them up mm -hmm. in a row it was and one thing i haven't talked about is spatialization um but that's even with the part of the piece i just played for for you it wasn't stereo that one was quadraphonic so there's four speakers some things were left and right some things were channels three and four um for people who don't know what I'm talking about, like your stereo, your headphones are two channels, left and right. Those are two channels. But if you go to the movies, you've probably noticed sounds just coming from multiple speakers. But it's not just multiple speakers playing everything the same. Something is a little bit, you know, in front of you. Something is behind you. Um, with the right setup, you can you can control. You know, you can send sounds to hundreds of speakers if you have the right interfaces and number of speakers in the software. So with the piece on the high line, there's five speakers mounted on the ceiling um, or the top of over this uh, pedestrian uh, uh, walkway. And there was about 12 sounds per speaker. And I structured them so that how, how they, they also played within that 30 second. I think they, I do think that they all start together uh, depending on how they were recorded, some might take three seconds, some might take 20 seconds. The last one just rings out until 30 seconds. But basically, I made decisions of what sounds went to what speaker. Um, and I had that file all play exactly on the on the minute. It was a computer that was hooked up to a um, an atomic clock so that it would knew exactly when the hour hit. And that would trigger all of those sounds to play at the, that moment. Okay. And also, I will say that if anybody is shy or if anybody thinks of a question later or tomorrow, you know, definitely don't don't hesitate. Send me an email. Um, Sarah can give you my email, or I can put it in the chat in a few minutes. But as old as I am and as long as I've been doing this, I still go to talks and I'm like, I've got this nervous feeling and I don't want to speak up or something occurs to me later. Um, so if you're feeling any of that and you want to write to me, don't, you know, don't hesitate. Um, but I, I just, I thought we'd do a couple things just showing you a little bit how I work and then probably the last and, and some things we could do with your sounds. If we still have time at the end, I want to show you some uh, a work in progress for a film soundtrack. Um, but this is, I don't know how many of you work with electronic um, or digital audio workstations. This is um, Ableton Live, which is a very popular software. It was originally marketed for DJs and probably you know the majority of people who use it or a lot of people who use it are using it for techno or, or you know, electronic music um, of one form or another, often beat structured, but it doesn't mean you have to do that. Um, I use Ableton Live, I use Pro Tools. I often use Ableton Live for generating sounds, making loops, manipulating sounds, um, but then I'll use Pro, Pro Tools for structuring and especially if I'm structuring um, editing to picture for a, a film or video. But one of the things that they have in here are synthesizers, um, but you can also bring in your own sounds and I put in your sounds as well as some of mine. Um, you know, and if you like, I'm just hitting the keys on my computer, I could hook this up to a keyboard, but you're hearing that, aren't you? Okay, good. Um, so this is just you know, a, a synthesizer that comes with it. This is really kitsch, but they give you, you know, one of the things you can do is under MIDI effects, there's um, arpeggiators and you've all heard this sound like, so here I was just playing a note, right? But if I turn on the arpeggiator, just one finger is, is playing that, I could change it. It's not the kind of thing I do, 
but it's the kind of thing I make use of. In like that piece that I just played you um, from Montalvo, the, the wings piece. So, you know, like if you take, so if I took, I can't really play piano, but I played piano. Um, I was at a residency of the artist Robert Rauschenberg. He's passed away, but his estate. And when everybody had gone to sleep, I put forks and knives and pennies in the strings and played a little bit. did a lot of things like that, just improvising. There's a lot of um, strong reverb in the room. It really is echoey, but it was a very nice echoey. And the way that I've done too many projects now, I actually have to stop, <laughs> but is to take a sampler program, um, in this case, it's Ableton has one called Simpler. And, you know, if you take a sampler, you can put sounds in, play them on a keyboard, probably heard people like put a, a dog sound and every note could be or whatever you want it to be. Um, and then slice up that thing that I've just done and into little chunks, it, it'll automatically look for the peaks. And so I can, oh, oh, wrong thing, sorry. Let's move that. That's one note. So I'm just hitting different notes on my keyboard and it's jumping to different parts of, you know, that whatever so so little improvisation I had done. But if I turn on like the, the arpeggiator and hit a single note, It starts to create. It's it starts to find patterns, and I can manipulate things. Let me get rid of that. So I have this other sequencer that oops, creates patterns randomly. It's called a Turing machine, um, and I just I, I will I'll look for like accidental melodies, and then do one other thing. And I'm going to add a looper. So I might start to just let it play. And there's a there's a looper here. I'm giving you all my secrets, but one thing that I like to do is, so a looper takes a sound that you put into it and will then keep playing it. You could overdub on top of that. Um, I have so many looping pedals outside of your view, um, physical pedals, but here in the software, it does the same thing. It captures it and then it'll keep playing the same. You know, it used to be a certain kind of music. That's where you heard loops, but now you know, Ed Sheeran or, I mean, just, you know, from, from hip hop to like pop, you'll see looping pedals in so many kinds of music these days. But what I'm going to do is capture the loop, but have it come back at an octave lower. Um, so there'll be what you, you were hearing with a loop of it, um, an octave lower in real time. Add other sounds in. I can manipulate those sounds.
Let's make Madame a little slower. Actually, no, but there's a sweet voice. change the pitch of this loop again. Which one was it? It's one of you. Um, it's the sound of my electric toothbrush. <laughs> Tooth electric toothbrushes are very fertile <laughs> instruments. Yeah. I have an electric toothbrush that has that same setting. It's that's a good <laughs> setting. <laughs> and if you put it in your mouth deeper, wider, against an object, you'll get all sorts of sounds. Yeah, that's what I was doing. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Let's try, mm -hmm. let's mess with that for a second. Like one of the nice things in Ableton is that you can instantly transpose it. You could add some effects. Just the toothbrush, keep in mind. to know one thing that I've got is so you can see the faders are moving up and down on the, on the, on the computer which clicking and you know none of this is nearly as inspiring as touching a cello or in some ways you know the physical in, interaction with an instrument but the more that you can play a computer like an instrument the better and often things like an interface so as I move um, as I move these faders, you know, this one's hooked up to track four, which we got kind of defaulted to Bashford Man. Um, or I could play Madam with number, it's number five, or I might have moved Madam. But in any case, each one of these is connected to a function. 
um, of the faders in the software so that I don't have to just keep clicking and dragging. And it allows me to perform a mix in a slightly different way than going backwards, I think. Oh, there I go. But there's so, I mean, you know, if, if, especially for those of you who are new to working like this, um, you know, there's so much just you study experimental music, if you look to tape music or music concrete, so many of what was done in early experiments using records at one point, reel-to-reel -reel tape, um, other technologies, these discoveries of for Pierre Schaefer, what it was like to take a train sound and suddenly and hear it backwards was, was revolutionary to people who had one, you know, kind of background of music. Um, all right, so let's. All right, so let's get rid of the effects. Uh, let's, let's hear that backwards. Uh, we could we could slow it down and pitch it pitch it down. Because a lot of these the recordings you all sent me, um, they're fantastic, but a lot of them were done, you know, relatively low fi like on phones. When you pitch them down, when they're recorded that way, we're going to lose uh, harmonics, we're going to lose quality that if you recorded with a really nice microphone in a studio at a very high resolution, you could pitch these down and retain some more of the um, you know, a kind of higher fidelity. And there's a lot to be said for lo-fi, but it doesn't mean that hi-fi is always the best. But just to say that if we'd recorded this in a different way, it might be a more convincing cello or double bass. Let's find something else. I don't know if I'm missing, I'm not really singling out whose pieces I'm playing um, intentionally. Let's see what happens if we go higher. I'm back in toothbrush land. Um, ooh, so that, uh, let's go. Seems like there is a voice in there. Let's go back to normal pitch and see what we're hearing. And again, I'm, you know, now I'm just sort of messing and imagining we're all sitting in a room together, but. Um, if I'm doing anything and you want me to explain it or, or otherwise, just tell me. You know, there's something to me also wonderful about how lo-fi that is. It sounds like it's coming from an old radio. Um, we could make it even more aged if we wanted make it sound like it's coming through different speakers in a in a mosque in a um, there's so many ways to to manipulate a sound and then you know as much as you change them you also want them to fit into some kind of a form is there anything from these sound files anybody was curious or wanted to hear in a certain way Okay, I'm going to play it like I'm watching the clock as time Can clicks you? away. Tell me. Can you make Madam slower? Let's hear Madam. Can you hear? With this software, I can definitely make Madam lower pitched. I have to remember how to do her slower. I'm going to have to do that in a different software. <laughs> That's Madam, right? I think sure there's just a stop of quiet. It's, Let's, um, let's make a loop of Madam. Let's, all right, let's, at least I can pitch her down. 
<laughs> Actually, I think I want her lower. Even lower? Yes. All right, let's see how low with this software and that sound. I think if I change this, she will go slower. No, it's the other way. Here comes. This is going to be. I think I like that. Seems good, huh? Yeah, Madam was a nice recording. And then having that bit of voice at the end was so sweet. I, I don't know. know why I changed my name. Why you changed? Why, why I changed my name for, to the. Oh, that I don't know. Let's hear just your bit of voice. Oh, wait. That's the wrong one. And now you're now you're like a um, scary old man. That is my cat meowing. Her name is Madam. Madam Curie. But I just call her Madam. I will say, say I hope you or your family save that file. Um, we all have home movies. We all, or many of us, have home movies or photographs from childhood. But there's something about the voice. There's someone I used to babysit for who grew up to be a famous actress, and I recorded her when she was 11, and her sister. And she was talking about directing. She's now a director, but at the time she was yelling at her sister that she was directing her state her radio play. And many years later, when she was at like the um, Golden Globes or something. I sent her mother that recording. My mother's like, that's not my child. And she played it for her, her daughters. And they're like, yeah, that is us. But we don't, you know, we don't, we forget the, the, you know, your, your voice, my friend, the, the friend, the owner of Madam, what's your actual name? Solve. So, they, so your, your voice is going to be so different someday in the tone, texture, emotion that comes through. It'd be very nice for your family to have even that little bit. They, people will not realize that how much you have changed. So there's one more thing I would share with you, which no one in the world has seen, um, but I got permission to share with you. And then we'll probably talk a little bit and then stop. Um, but I do, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, like, like my real education was doing soundtracks for visual artists. And that's how I learned was, I worked with the artist named Jean Paik. I made music for the dancer Mikhail Baryshnikov at one point. I, um, a lot of younger video artists, Jim Cohen, an amazing filmmaker. And I just, I learned by seeing what their vocabulary was, figuring out how I could make sound that fit their landscape, but also kept my own um, identity. And I guess, and, and, you know, just amazing opportunities I had. And part of it was, was a lot of it was networking, going up to people, writing to people and asking if they wanted to collaborate or if I could make sound for them. Collaborate can mean many different things, but would they be interested to hear what I did? And the artist that I've probably, for many years I worked with more than any other was named Eder Santos from Brazil. Um, I hope this works. I'm just gonna check something and then I'm gonna show you the window in a second. This will be in a different software. All right, in theory, this is going to work. So I haven't, I haven't been working with Edder as much in many years, but every once in a while, he'll write to me and say, can you um, work on something? He sent me, it's a feature film, it's, which means it's approximately 90 minutes long. Uh, he speaks Portuguese, a little bit of, you know, some English, but mostly we just communicate by like 
quick messages in an experience of having worked together. I'm going to show you a little bit of this section of a film, which is a, a kind of dream sequence. We'll talk over it. Um, I have to mute everything. I remember how to mute. But he didn't tell me what to do. Um, kind of amazingly, he already had sound where he wanted me to make sound, but he wanted me to make sound on top of it. So there, there's this sound going on. Um, I don't know if you can hear it depending on your sound playback, but this very low rumble. This man is waking up, but he's actually waking up in a dream. Um, I tried a few different pieces of music. I mean, a lot of people who make music for film or video or television will watch and very carefully play to it, you know, figure out a tempo in a scene or perform to it. I just, I just I watch something, I turn off the screen, I go away and I make some pieces of music. And then I come back and start to see how they fit together. So I did a few things and using that same technique I showed you with that bit of piano, I made a 16 minute performance um, of manipulating the piano and you'll see that on this purplish track. And it just seemed to fit his movements. And then I thought I needed some melody and there's a film I was working on a year ago Sarah was kind enough to perform to a track for me. The film was canceled. And I went through her violin tracks and I started cutting them up and just finding little moments that seemed to fit with pitch, but also mood. So I'll show you um, just you know a couple minutes or a minute or two just of this part of the film um, with my soundtrack with Sarah playing and um, as well as the original sound that Edder had in there. feeling like there's too much effect on Sarah's violin, but you can see, you know, 
how much this can, this, I mean, this, I'm gonna make this silly too much. Later, it gets faster. Kind of amazing to me that these violin parts fit. Um, you know, we could have, I mean, this, this is with this moment. And I tried to place it so it goes along with that moment where he's looking up. If we, the same sound, the same thing without Sarah. seems to instantly be missing something. Um, there's still a cello track coming. My friend Anne Bourne, who's an amazing cellist uh, in Canada, is recording a cello that she'll send to me. That hopefully will connect the violin and the piano in a nice way. Um, I just thought you, you know, just getting a peek into some of the decisions some of the things I tried to do, one thing I'll show, I'll play the last thing I'll do is I tried to make Sarah into a, um, so this is as a violin. Rápida é a droga, e assim como um beijo a morte. I tried to make that into a cello, <laughs> and it's, but it, I don't know, it, it's sort of in, like, I'm gonna pitch it down. And make it longer. The software didn't do a convincing enough job of making it work, but it made me think that the idea of having something with that kind of depth could be really nice there. Um, but in any case, there's I'll play a little, little bit of the credit sequence. I'm jumping over something that Sarah made me promise. There's one part with like people have no clothes on, so I cut that out, so don't worry about that. But there's just some happy credit music. Um, just to hear a little bit of it, and then I'm going to close this.
that. If you, depending on how you're listening, there's a really nice long reboot. So I don't know, that film should, it'll come out in Brazil someday. Um, from what I hear, the government has frozen all their funds. So they've just, all pr production has stopped, but hopefully that film will come out one day and it'll be in Portuguese, but maybe it'll be in English with subtitles too. Um, that was a lot. And I don't know if I, you know, I hope I didn't over represent the idea of playing with your sounds, but for me to hear them, hopefully you, you know, for you just to see some of the flexibility of the magic of what can be done with them might've been helpful. There's a lot of software out there that's, there's software that's free, there's software that's, a, you know, that's on the cheaper side, there's, there's ones that are more expensive. Um, if anybody wants advice, you could email me, uh, tell me a little bit about what you're doing, and I'd more than happily uh, you know, work with you to get you some ideas. Uh, Reaper is a good one. Audacity is free. Uh, if you have a Mac computer, you probably have GarageBand. You know, whatever you can get your hands on is, is good, and it should be good enough. Uh, I've been doing this so long, and I get personally stupidly snobby about if I don't have that certain sound like instrument or that microphone or that reverb, I, I'll never, you know, be happy. But truthfully, you can do a whole lot with, you know, with a phone. Uh, there's some beautiful apps out there. There's synthesizers for phones, for computers. Um, that, that is just every day there's more, you know, more out there. And it seems like if you're under the age of 15, you're probably born knowing how to use it. <laughs> and if you're over the age of 45, it's a little bit more of a struggle. But, um, you know, we all, we all do our best and we all make use of what we, you know, we find the tools that work for us too. Do you guys have any questions or comments or criticisms or I don't know, any, anything you want to talk about? Can I start? Please. So Stephen, thank you so much for this. I've followed your work for quite a while and oh, um, yeah, and I really appreciate this kind of overview and and you just giving us a glimpse into your magic. Um, so the one thing I'm curious about is, can you talk about um, how the pandemic has impacted the work that you're doing? And certainly what are you looking, what do you think will change about what you're doing? What are you looking for forward to in 2021? We hopefully can get out and, start to do more field recording or do more public installation kind of work. I'm, I'm kind of curious about that. But again, yeah. thank you so much for this. I appreciate yeah, it. And thank you, Sarah, for allowing me to hop on and, and come along. No, more than happily. I mean, it's, it's funny because the pandemic has allowed me more time. I mean, I'm a, I'm a department chair and a, and a professor at a university, which is so demanding. But the, you know, the, the crazy thing is, is that I'm sitting in the same space. I'm not commuting. <laughs> So I'm giving class or I'm in a meeting with the dean, but I'm you know, a few feet from a table of pedals, a guitar, my, an, an old amplifier, modular synthesizer. And I've, I've learned to like shut my brain into different places. And as soon as the meeting's over, if I have half an hour, I just jump into something else. If I have something else I'm inspired to do, uh, as soon as the pandemic hit, I started reaching out to friends and my friend Robin, who's also called Scanner, said, let's, you know, let's start doing some recordings. Um, we did a record with me playing guitar with Robin playing, um, doing bass and drums. I don't know when it'll come out, but we made a whole lot of material and there's one track on my SoundCloud page. Um, and Colin Newman from Wire played one of our son songs on his radio show that's archived. Uh, and then another, collaborator, Michael Gregoni, who plays pedal steel and lap steel, and a sound artist in Japan, Chihi Hatakayama, I probably don't say that well, um, who Mike and I wanted to work with. We wrote to him and said, we're all shut in our studios. Let's start working on an album. Um, I did one field recording trip to West Virginia. And I mean, the, the one good thing about the pandemic is there's less air traffic, there's less traffic. And the world is a lot quieter, and it's it's not so safe to travel. But I had a friend who 
we tra I, you know, who had been quarantining, I was, I'd been never leaving my house. We drove to this cabin uh, and did recordings at that time of the 17 year cicadas. And A, emotionally, it was just incredible to get out, but it also just being in the mountains of West Virginia, the planes weren't flying, it was so quiet and it was so inspiring. Uh, so I've, I've made a lot of use of have, being shut in, being socially awkward and being secretly happy not to have to be out interacting with too many people. Um, I know it's true. And, and just, as I say, I think, you know, some people, it's very hard for them to shut down one part of their brain and shut, turn on another. For me, it's like, it's a, um, I don't know, it's a, a means of survival of just going, I love my school, I love my students, I, I, but oh my, I need a break. And just instantly picking up, you know, I have this very, my, my, my beautiful guitar that is um, made out of old barn wood. And just with a you know, flip of the power switch, I can be up and recording and not, you know, most things are not good. You know, probably 28 days out of the month, what I make is terrible. And then for two days in the month, I make things that I, a lot of things that I like. And so another thing to me that's very important is just to keep going. I also found out I have rheumatoid arthritis and every time I play guitar, my knuckles swell up, but that makes me want to play guitar more. Um, and I got a classical guitar because it's easier on my string, my fingers and started doing classical studies, even though I'm terrible at them. But I used, I used to work for the artist named Jim Paik and after he had a stroke, every day I would go over to see him, he would be drawing. And he said something to me once about just, you know, if he couldn't do this, he had to be doing something. If he wasn't, you know, he couldn't put his hands on his video synthesizer, but as long as he was drawing, then he was thinking. And I've always taken that to heart that you do what you can when you can do it. You know, whether it's good or not in your own self critique, just doing is really valuable. That's super, I've, thank you. Yeah, yeah sure. I don't want to fatigue anybody more than I have, but you know, I also don't want to leave you all if there's any other questions. I'm going to put my email in the chat if anybody wants to find me. Um, and it's really easy to Google, but you can look up my website. Um, And as I say, I know this audience was was very different skill sets, very different ages. Um, I think the thing I could say is I, I have so little confidence in my abilities in some ways, and I have a drive to do something. And I think coming out of punk rock music, um, that that kind of gave me the permission to just feel like I should, I could, you know, and. Some of you are probably incredible musicians, but might think, well, I can't do this other thing. Um, and I, you know, I totally disagree. And if you want to do it, it doesn't mean you have to do it, but, or you should do it. But if you feel driven to do it, there's so many ways to enter, um, you know, widening your, your, your palette, your ways of working. Working with other people is always a great thing. Working with people who do things that are totally different than you is a great thing. Um, for having a community of people to be with and, and share ideas is, is an incredible thing. So, you know, I think I don't know a lot about your school, but I know Sarah being there means it's a good thing. You've all been so sweet and, and you know, attentive. And so that's got to show something very important and good. Um, but, you know, when you're ready for changes, when you're ready to do something that you haven't done, if you're a great guitar player or flute player and want to just try playing your flute into a tube, a cardboard tube and listening to what changes or going in your bathroom and listening to the acoustics or going to a tunnel and playing your flute, you'll probably change instantly about what, you know, your mind, your mind will open. Um, if you play things and your cat hates them, could be or could be good, could be bad. 
My cats used to hate the sound of Paulina Oliveros's um, accordion on this record I was working on, and my daughter loved it when she was a baby. You know, so you know, different, different voices, different ears. But uh, see what see what speaks to you, and if it speaks to you, you know, let it keep going. Okay. All right. So I will say goodbye, but do write to me. Thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you all. Thank you um, so much. Thank you. Thank you. This was so inspiring, and hopefully uh, we can all meet in person in the future. I would love it. I know? would so love it. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much, Stephen. All right. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you for submitting yeah. those sounds and. Yeah. Thank you for those. Yeah. Have a thank one. you. This is really cool. My pleasure. Totally a pleasure. All right. Be well, everybody. Stay safe. Thank you Bye. all. Bye. Bye. Bye.